Obrigada, Jope. So good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for a little delay. It was a traffic jam, and of course, you can blame the driver, so sorry for that. But anyway, so I welcome again uh, Markus Rantala, who is from the University in Turku in Finland, and today he will be talking about several aspects of evolutionary psychopathology, and he will be also presenting uh, what he actually wrote down in, in a book, right, on, on biology of depression, which is still, I think, in Finnish language, so we are unable to read or understand anything, but it seems that it might be soon, hopefully, translated into English, which might be interesting. So, thank you again that you are here with us, and I'm looking forward. Thank you. So, my, my view to mental health problems is completely different than what you can find from, from, from uh, psychology or psychiatry textbooks. That's because my background is in zoology and uh, I'm also immunologist. And when you combine those views to the current empirical evidence, you will have a very different view about mental health problems. And I hope that you like that view. Because I'm a zoologist, um, I'm interested about animals, not only about humans, but I, I see human as a similar animal as any other animals. And <clears throat> for me, it's quite obvious that other animals have emotions and they do get depressed. But that's, that's not the case. Many psychiatrists think that, or psychologists think that depression uh, occurs also only in humans. But animals have emotions, and uh, if you go to uh, zoos around the world, you will see a lot of animals which are depressed. It's very easy to see that they are uh, depressed. You don't need to do any diagnosis, you just follow their behavior. And, and <clears throat> because I'm also entomologist, I have been working with insects for years. Uh, my interest is also not only mammals, but all animal kingdoms. And I be, have became interested whether Insects can have mental health problems, and it's interesting that actually they have. For example, there is a lot of studies to show that um, insects have emotion, and for example, unexpected rewards make bees optimistic, and agitated honeybees become pessimistic. And uh, actually, they are quite clever. They are able to uh, learn to use tools by observing the behavior of other individuals, so they must have some kind of theory of mind, and so on, so it's not surprising that they get depressed, but usually those who study insects, they don't use for depression, instead they use for the learned helplessness. But for example, when cockroaches are tortured by uh, electric shock, they develop depression, and uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, when researchers make a study where they uh, tortured them with uh, uh, electric shocks, uh, and after that they forced them to uh, exercise in treadmill, and uh, they found that that uh, exercise alleviated the symptom of the depression. So it seems to very similar to humans. That is also known in humans that exercise is very effective treatment against depression, and. Uh, there is a lot of studies on depression in Drosophila melanocaster, and people have developed different ways to torture them and cause depression. And it's interesting that the same neurochemicals play a role in depression in Drosophila than in humans. And the uh, most interesting study was made uh, in Drosophila where they gave a uh, Recently made it females to male, and uh, usually uh, recently uh, made it females uh, refuse mating again. Uh, and uh, when they gave those recently made it females to males, they became uh, depressed uh, after females rejected them. And when they gave them chance to drink alcohol, those males that uh, were rejected, they, fought, they drink four times more alcohol than those who were not rejected. And the researchers are uh, able to show that the reason why they do 
that is because they alleviate their bad mood by drinking alcohol. So when they give drugs that prevent uh, uh, change in mood, they were not interested about uh, uh, drinking alcohol. And uh, of course, psychiatrists has long known that uh, other mammas get depressed and they have studied effects of, of uh, antidepressant and other drugs on uh, rats for a long time and they have tried to develop different objective m way to measure depression and, uh, and uh, it's not so interesting how to measure depression but it's more interesting how to make rodents depressed and they have also developed many methods to do that. For example, if you do olfactory pulmonectomizing, it causes uh, depression in rats and they know the me uh, physical mechanism behind that very well. And it's actually interesting that in humans, if people uh, lose their ability to smell, it's often associated with depression. And uh, they have also uh, used the rodents as a model organs how traumatic childhood experience influence on mental health and they do it so that they will take pups from the mother for a couple of hours and put them from the, the cage uh, where they, there's no cover and uh, it's caused very strong stress for those uh, pups and they have shown that when they do it many times in the childhood then when they are adults they are more sensitive for stress stress and uh, they have higher ought to have anxiety and depression. And uh, it's, uh, science, rodents are very social animals. If they uh, are put alone to the cage, then they will get depressed quite soon. And uh, it's interesting that uh, what happens for those isolated uh, rats because if you researcher give them uh, food unlimited, uh, if the food is uh, contains a lot of fat and sugars like cookies, those uh, uh, rats who are alone in the cage, they become obese very soon because they start to um, self-medicate their bad mood by comfort eating. And here is is uh, two. Uh, Clones, uh, cloned uh, mice, one of it was, it uh, was uh, lived in uh, groups of other rats and one which uh, lived alone in the cage. And you can easily see that uh, uh, that uh, one who lived alone had uh, got obese because of that comfort eating. So it seems that similar to rats, uh, similar to humans, also rats uh, do comfort eating when they are they feel that they are alone. And uh, of course, uh, you can see that uh, when they are alone, it's caused uh, increase in stress hormone levels and in different parameters, how they measure stress, how, like, uh, uh, for example, they do an experiment where they drop a uh, rat inside the um, pocket full of water and look how, much, uh, how long time they try to swim and escape from there. And, uh, also, if they live from the tail, they look how much time they start, how they try to fight back and uh, so on. But there is very many different ways how to get them depress, uh, depressed. For example, if you provide them alcohol or certain drugs and they use it a long time, then they also become uh, depressed, like humans do also. Many uh, drugs are known to cause uh, depression. And, uh, one thing which doesn't sound good at all is that uh, it seems that pollution also is able to trigger depression in uh, rodents. In this uh, study, researchers uh, exposed mice to air pollution for six hours per day, five days per week, for 10 months. And the amount of pollution was similar that we can observe in many cities around the world. And it was uh, interesting that air pollution caused depression and decreased memory and ability to learn in those. So, for example, if you live in big cities around the world, this might be one reason why uh, depression and other mental health problems are more common. 
And um, some of you might find it weird that there, but there is rats, and, uh, and actually, or uh, and um, other rodents like these prairie voles that are uh, depressed when if they lose their uh, partner. For example, prairie voles uh, form a lifelong monogamic uh, pair bonding with their mates, and uh, if they lose their mate. Uh, they will get depressed. For example, males uh, defend, uh, stop defending their territories and they lose their appetite and then they won't, they won't clean their fur anymore. And if you uh, lift them from the tail, they don't uh, try to uh, bite you anymore. And if you drop them into a bucket of water, they don't try to escape, they just float there. So it, it seems that just like humans, also rodents get depressed if they lose their uh, suppose, and uh, of course, depression is very common also in other primates, and uh, uh, sometimes it might be even adaptive for them. For example, if male chimpanzees who, who, who has alpha position lose the, his, his position, uh, he will become depressed and his. Uh, Behavior changes so that for humans it's very easy to see that it's depression and it seems that the depression is signal for that new alpha male that the uh, old uh, leader has given up and uh, won't treat uh, the new male's position and that helps him to save his life because chimpanzees are not able to change the uh, group and they won't survive alone in the forest. So that's very adaptive for them uh, to, uh, sign, uh, to show uh, that they uh, are not to treat for that new uh, male anymore. And uh, it's interesting that it seems that serotonin plays a role in primates in social ranks. So that those males who have higher rank in the social hierarchy, they have higher serotonin level. And when uh, they, their rank drops, also their serotonin level uh, uh, drops and if you give them uh, drugs that increase serotonin level, they uh, try to climb up in the uh, in, in, in that social hierarchy. So there is a lot of evidence to so that uh, serotonin uh, plays and uh, and there is experimental evidence on that. But uh, of course, some one of you might think that okay, they might have some kind of depression, but it doesn't feel diagnostic criteria of. of DSM, uh, which is used in psychiatry. But there are studies which have actually used exactly the same uh, uh, those, uh, diagnostic criteria that is used in DSM-5. And here is one study which they did on um, uh, chimpanzees. In that study, they, had, uh, they followed the uh, life of 196 uh, wild chimpanzees and uh, 168 chimpanzees that live in, in the sanctuaries. Those chimpanzees in the sanctuary were rescued from the uh, private owners or, or drug uh, companies, and they tried to help uh, them uh, to leave in a, to, first to help them to leave and then release them uh, to the uh, wild. And um, when they did the study, they found that that. Uh, 58 males uh, or females from uh, 58 percent of the males and fem uh, females uh, that live in the sanctuaries, they did fulfill the diagnostic criteria of depression, and only three individuals in the wild. And of course, it's logical because some males lose their rank and they get depressed. So depression is normal part of the life, but it's not common to be depressed and uh, they are not, they are not depressed in all time in the wild. And also PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, was very common in captivity but very rare in the wild. It was only one case and that was uh, a male who escaped from the, uh, the trap of post po uh, poachers and uh, it developed PTSD uh, against humans after that. 
but one of, you might be surprised that one of the places where the, uh, in the world where the depression is most common is fish farms. So next time when you eat salmon, uh, you uh, might uh, eat actually uh, salmon with, uh, might have uh, experienced low mood. But um, it's more than that. In Norway, they did a uh, study where they found that uh, about 25% of fish living in those farms suffer depression. And uh, it's not only about bad mood, but it's uh, so that they stop swimming and they start to uh, remain very close to the surface and uh, they stop eating. And uh, because of that, they be become lean and, uh, and uh, they usually die and those uh, fish farmers just collect them every day. Uh, those uh, away uh, uh, to, and throw those away, and there is, uh, 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 is uh, from the same uh, fam uh, school uh, uh, healthy fish and uh, which is exactly the same age and this is who is depressed. So you can see that there is phenotypical differences uh, caused by that stress. And it's interesting that those uh, who get depressed they have tens of times higher cortisol level than uh, those healthy ones. So they suffer from chronic stress. And this is very interesting study because they didn't study only up, uh, uh, cortisol, but they also dis dissected their brain and measured amount of serotonin. And they found out, uh, out that those uh, with chronic stress, they have upregulated serotonin system and so they have very high levels of serotonin. And that's explained why they lose their appetite, because there is uh, the, the, actually um, serotonin and uh, dopamine are antagonists. <coughs> so if you have a lot of serotonin, it prevents the increase in dopamine level. And <coughs> if uh, your uh, serotonin levels are up, then uh, eating doesn't make you feel good because it doesn't produce dopamine and it, dopamine also influences your willing to eat uh, or do anything which previously make you, you feel good. So <coughs> that's completely opposite that what you uh, can read from psychiatric textbook because they say that, uh, that uh, depressed individuals have too low levels of serotonin and that's caused the problem and, and by eating antidepressants you will get uh, better soon. But studies do, do not support that. It seems that both high serotonin level and low serotonin level are associated with depression, but the symptoms are a little bit different. And uh, there is evidence in other animals where they have caused stress and they saw clearly that when animals are stressed, stress triggers uh, production of serotonin and, and uh, so uh, those depressed patients which have chronic stress, they don't have low serotonin level. Instead, they have high serotonin level. And that's uh, uh, which produces those problems. And we even know the mechanism. It seems that the stress triggers neuroinflammation, and that neuroinflammation produces interleukin 11, which upregulates serotonin nervous system in the brain. So, so, if you look animal studies, it's clear that there is different types of depression. So different factors are able to trigger depression, and their symptoms are a little bit different. So while uh, those uh, chronically stressed fish in the fish farm they lose their appetite, those uh, socially isolated uh, rats start to do comfort eating. And in these animals, they have low serotonin level, and that's why eating produces uh, co uh, good feelings. And, uh, and uh, based on this view, if you start to look depression in humans, it, it makes much more sense than if you uh, have read psychiatric textbooks which says that there is only one type of depression, and uh, um, and it's associated with uh, low serotonin level. It's interesting that studies in humans shows that dif different 
triggering factors lead different uh, type of depressive symptoms. For example, if you lose your spouse, you will get very different kind of symptoms of depression than if you have seasonal affective disorder or if you, uh, you are fired from the work. So, and, um, so it's interesting why different triggering factors produce different symptoms. And if you uh, look animal studies, we could make hypothesis that maybe those symptoms of depression are adaptation to solve that triggering, triggering factor. And uh, actually studies in humans show that not all depressive patients have similar uh, function of the brain. So they, for example, studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging found that depressive patients belong at least four different neurophysiological subtypes that is clustered of individuals who have different symptom-linked brain features. And these cluster of individuals differ in response to transcranial magnetic stimulus therapy. And uh, from the point of evolutionary psychology, this uh, depressive episode might be an adaptation against the specific adaptive problems, or they may be maladaptive state caused by environmental mismatch as a result of modern lifestyle, or they might be a byproduct of other adaptations, or they may be just a pathological state without any adaptive function. Uh, psychiatrists see that depression is always a pathological state without any adaptive function, and this seems to be also a case in, ma in many uh, therapeutists uh, who give psychoanalysis or on any other kind of therapies. But there is other uh, possibilities too. And of course, uh, we should be able to uh, test that, uh, which one of those are true, or is it possible that different triggering factors produce different kind of depression, which have different adaptive function, and, or some of them might be byproduct, and some of them might be maladaptive. And it seems to be that is the, actually the case. And we published four years ago an article where we suck, uh, suggested that based on empirical evidence, it seems that depression is not single disorder. Instead, there is different types of depression. Uh, and that you can, uh, can uh, divide them on different subgroups uh, based on the triggering factors. And uh, these triggering factors produce a little bit different kind of symptoms. They cause different kind of physical responses in the brain. And also, uh, for example, uh, stress system may work uh, different in different subtypes. I don't have enough time to explain all of this. I recommend you to read our latest paper to be actually published uh, a couple of months ago. Actually, I, I recommend to read this book. We published a book chapter in this book where we explain these subtypes. And this was published during this autumn. It's, uh, it's edited by Riyad Abed and Paul St. John Smith. And uh, so, if we look at uh, depression from this point of view, then it changes completely how we should treat them, because in some of these subtypes, the uh, symptoms might be different, and same treatment might help some of patients, but in other subtypes, it actually may uh, make the symptoms uh, even worse. For example, uh, if uh, chronic stress uh, triggers uh, neuroinflammation and cause increase in, in a serotonin level, then if you give antidepressant for them, it's very easy to see that it just uh, increases those symptoms and cause anxiety and other problems. It's uh, associated with high serotonin level. But for example, if a person has got fired from the work and it's known that it's re uh, people respond in the same way that if they would have lost their rank in social hierarchy, 
the, uh, the, the serotonin level goes down, and for those patients, actually, antidepressant might help. So I'm pretty sure that in future, medical interest will be interested uh, uh, because this would explain why not, uh, not all of patients with depression get uh, help from the antidepressants. And uh, of course, uh, antidepressants just helps to alleviate symptoms. They don't treat the root reason which co it caused that depression. So it seems that uh, major depressive disorder is much more complicated than what psychiatric textbook tell about it. And that's explain why so many people end up eating antidepressant for decades without any help because it doesn't uh, help those symptoms which, uh, or th that root reason which it trigger that. And um, it's also, the in, uh, if you want to understand this, you need to understand the evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology in general. It's important to uh, note that natural selection has produced responses anxiety, low mood, and pain because they have helped our ancestors propagate their genes to the next generation. And there is huge cost of uh, if you don't have these uh, these uh, emotions. And uh, it's also important to note that natural selection make population to adapt on that environment where it lives. And if that environment changes fast, then those previously adaptive traits may become maladaptive. And that actually seems to be the case in many uh, cases in uh, humans, that uh, those previous adaptive traits do not uh, help us anymore, even they might have been uh, adaptive for people living hunter gatherer lifestyle. So, it uh, might be interesting uh, to you that depressive around the world has increased a lot during the during the uh, last decades, and it seems that uh, because of COVID, it has become even much higher nowadays. Even in Finland, we have wide high prevalence of de uh, depression, and we have very good uh, record of uh, prevalence of that. And for it shows that, for example, between 2011-2017, the amount of depressive patients increased more than uh, almost uh, 50 per percent. And actually, it's very sharp increase. And uh, the latest one, which has, was done during COVID time, uh, it suggests that it's, it increased even more. For example, it was uh, latest news that almost half of the university students had uh, either anxiety disorder or, any, uh, or depression or any other mental uh, health problem, which so that we have a big problem. And uh, this 9% uh, or 13% might sound high, but I think uh, none of you knows that studies show that Finland is the most happiest country in the world. This uh, World Health Organization has studied this topic for a long time, and each year Finland is number one there. So if the happiest uh, people in the world has prevalence rate of uh, depression of 9% uh, for men and 18% for women. So it would be interesting to know what is the prevalence of depression in those uh, uh, countries which are least happy in the world. And, um, and uh, if we uh, look at those different countries, and uh, we might understand what are those factors behind this increase in uh, prevalence of depression. And uh, if we want to understand that, actually, we don't look at people who live Western lifestyle. Instead, the studies on uh, hunter gatherers have suggested that they have very, very low prevalence of depression. For example, uh, Schifelin made a study. 40 years ago, where he did live uh, more than 10 years with Kaluli people in Papua New Guinea. And during that time, he interviewed uh, more than 2,000 uh, members of the Kaluli people, and he found only one cases of, uh, uh, of depression. One person 
it met diagnostic criteria of uh, of, uh, of depression, and that was the woman who uh, whose husband uh, did beat him frequently, uh, and he was not able to uh, divorce that. And uh, so it's it's very interesting why it's so low uh, among that people, and it is, this is not. Uh, just the uh, outlier in the data, but because uh, anthropologists who have lived among those hunter gatherers around the world, they say that their mental health is much, much better than people who live Western uh, lifestyle. And uh, for example, in Hatsa, there was a BBC documentary where they said that they, uh, they interviewed a lot of those Hatsa people and they didn't meet, meet anybody who met the diagnostic criteria of uh, depression and also in Chimane people they did study on depression but they had to change the diagnostic criteria because people didn't meet that so when they wanted to understand adaptive components of depression what that diagnostic criteria which they use in western world wouldn't be applied for them and problem is that also how to study them because they don't know what depression means and uh, there is also other uh, tribes around the world like uh, Toraya people who live, uh, it's not complete hunter-gatherer lifestyle, but very traditional lifestyle and studies in them so that they have very low prevalence of depression. And also it's very uh, surprising that what has happened around the world is that when people have adopted Western lifestyle, prevalence of depression has rocketed very fast. For example, in China, it was found, uh, it was actually meta-analysis that in uh, uh, people born after 1966 uh, have 22.4 uh, times more likely to suffer from depressive episodes than Chinese born before 1937. And the same pattern exists around the world when if they are, uh, people look at all the data. And uh, that's not actually what DSM-5 says. So there is... Uh, mismatch between what psychiatrists think about depression and what is the reality. It, I am pretty sure that medical companies have something to do with that. And uh, for example, in indigenous people who have adopted Western life, they become depressed very fast. And for example, uh, in Canada, uh, among those uh, Inuits uh, who have uh, adopted Western lifestyle, the uh, suicide rate is uh, very high compared to the uh, rest of the uh, Canadians. So, of course, there's many reasons for that, but uh, it seems that uh, that uh, change in the lifestyle plays important role. And uh, meta-analysis shows that there is common pattern around the world that uh, the more Western lifestyle people live, the, the higher odds that uh, they will have depression. It's only it's between countries and also between countries. And uh, there is uh, one group of people who live in a Western world who have a very low prevalence of depression. And they are Amish, old order Amish people who live in, in the east coast of the United States. So they live a similar kind of lifestyle than their ancestors did live when they arrived to USA in the 17th century. So th they do not use cars or they are not allowed to use electricity. They, say, they uh, still make their farming uh, in an old-fashioned way and uh, they have very big family and they are very religious and they eat a very different kind of food than other Americans. And uh, Egeland and Hoster did a study where they interviewed uh, more than 8,000 of the members of the uh, people and they found that prevalence of depression was only 0.5. I just saw a new study, it wasn't published yet, but it's been published. It found a uh, similar prevalence of depression among Amis, which looks uh, suggests that this uh, traditional lifestyle somehow protect uh, them against depression, because at the same time, in the same uh, uh, ta towns and uh, uh, those people who have adopted Western lifestyle, they have very high prevalence of depression, something like 
13 to 15 percent. So if the uh, uh, difference is more than 30 times, uh, you can easily understand it must be something to do with their lifestyle. It's not only about genetic differences, uh, but and because also when they adopt uh, Western lifestyle, they will get depressed. So why they have so low uh, prevalence of depression? So that low prevalence of depression does not mean that uh, hunter gatherers or Amish wouldn't not have tragic tra 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 events in their lives. So it has been shown that they even have more uh, tra tragic uh, events in their life. For example, child mortality is very high among hunter gatherers. It was cal calculated that 47% of children die before they become teenagers. But when their children die, their, uh, their mood goes down, which is normal, but it comes up quite soon, and they don't meet the, uh, uh, cr the, the criteria of depression. So they won't uh, become suicidal, and they won't get pessimistic, and so on. And that uh, period of depression does not last two weeks, which is requirement of the uh, uh, major dep depressive dep disorder diagnostic. So it seems that there is some mechanism which uh, prevents normal regulation of mood among those people who live Western lifestyle. And it's interesting, what is the mechanism? So I was uh, a postdoc in USA for two years, and I li live in a, in a small in a city, Los, to the Los Angeles. And uh, I found the pictures uh, painted by artists in 18th century about the life in Los Angeles before white men uh, took their lands. So people, native people there did live hunter gatherer lifestyle. And in a couple of hundred years, their lifestyle changed completely. Now those native people eat junk food and watch TV and uh, they, there is traffic jams in average person from LA used three hours per day in the traffic jams. And at the same time, there is uh, uh, smoke all time, and uh, there is, uh, those seats are crowded by people, and nowadays uh, it's, uh, people are able to see more uh, uh, other humans during the, uh, during the one day than your ancestors were able to uh, see during their whole lifetime. So this is completely different kind of social environment than before. And it's interesting that people in big cities are much more lonely than in, uh, in countryside. And uh, also a uh, number of uh, social, net, uh, that the social network is much smaller in big cities than in the uh, countryside. And also, uh, 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 it's interesting that hunter gatherers are mo uh, most social people in the world. They have higher uh, interaction between different uh, of, of, of other people. So it seems that uh, our environment has changed much faster than, uh, than we were able to adapt. And the problem is that we are still equipped with similar brains and bodies as our ancestor who had a hunter gatherer lifestyle for millions of years. And that's cause problem for us. And uh, interesting, it, what are those problems? And uh, with Western lifestyle, we have got many, many diseases that doesn't exist among hunter gatherers. Uh, for example, uh, studies show that hardly any hunter gatherers are obese. Instead, uh, more than 65% of Americans are overweight nowadays. In Amish people, it was less than 1% who were overweighted. It's very different effect. And the and, uh, problem is that, that uh, the fat tissue produces pro-inflammatory cytokines and it uh, produces low-grade inflammation. And uh, that low-grade inflammation is behind many 
a disease of modern lifestyle. And for example, hunter-gatherers do not have Alzheimer's disease, they don't have diabetes too, they don't have arthritis, they don't have autoimmune diseases, they don't have neurological disease, they don't have pulmonary disease, they don't have many cancers, what we have now, and they don't have cardiovascular disease. Actually, uh, those hunter-gatherers have pe uh, best arthritis in the world. Uh, they, uh, there's a lot of studies to show that their, their, their overall health is better expect those uh, worms and other microbes that we can get. But uh, they don't have those uh, disease associated with, uh, with uh, low-grade inflammation. And uh, it seems that it's possible that what we call as depression is not own disease. It's actually malarity byproduct of, of, of inflammation. And there is actually nowadays huge evidence to support this view. And uh, there is tens of uh, uh, brain scanning studies which shows that those patients who have Neuro, uh, who have uh, major depressive disorder, they have neuroinflammation. So it means that the microglia cells in the brains are activated. Those are those cells which protect our brains against microbes and other invaders. And uh, here is one study where, it's because the figure was so beautiful, I choose this, but there is a lot of other studies. And uh, when they use uh, that, uh, brain scanning, they found that, that, that in all parts of brain, those who were depressed, they have higher um, number of activated microglia cells, which suggests that they have neuroinflammation. And like I told you, that neuroinflammation is associated with increased amount of uh, serotonin. That's the mechanism behind uh, that. And it, here is... Uh, uh, depressive scores and there is the amount of uh, those uh, activated microglia cells and so it seems that the higher the symptoms of depression the stronger neuroinflammation those people have and uh, it's important to note that of course there is many way what uh, mechanism what cause neuroinflammation for example it's known that if you are obese uh, that uh, fat cells produce those pro inflammatory cytokines and they are able to penetrate through the blood brain barrier and trigger neuroinflammation. But stress itself is able to trigger neuroinflammation. And uh, there is uh, already 2016 a uh, review article published in Nature Reviews of Immunology, which is one of the top journals in the world, which actually did explain the mechanism behind depression, how this neuroinflammation plays a role like, uh, uh, and uh, it's interesting that even uh, after that there has been hundreds of studies which uh, 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 more to support that hypothesis that psychiatrists hadn't changed their opinion about depression. So it's not, it has been shown that peripheral inflammation uh, cause uh, neuroinflammation and psychological stress cause neuroinflammation and also brain injury. It's interesting that uh, very big number, maybe it was more than 60 to 70 percent of those who have, uh, have brain injury, they've developed stress, uh, uh, depression. And uh, so this uh, inflammation says transmission of uh, different neurotransmitters which are associated with depression, not only uh, serotonin but also uh, dopamine and glutamate and uh, noradrenaline. And uh, also it's known that uh, this peripheral inflammation make your stress system uh, more sensitive for stress and it leads uh, clinical uh, it, uh, chronic stress more easily. And also, you probably have heard that the brains of depression, dep depressed people change so that amount of hippocampus will shrink because of uh, depression. And that's because that neuroinflammation reduces amount of no, neurotropic uh, uh, growth factors. And uh, there is also a lot of experimental evidence to support that this is the case. It's not only about correlative evidence. They have done studies where they have 
administrate uh, infrared cytokines for healthy patients, and they have found that healthy pa patients will get symptom of depression within three hours after administration of uh, those cytokines. And also uh, endotoxins like LPS uh, from the bacteria are able to trigger anxiety and depression for healthy people. It seems that uh, it's actually quite surprising that females are more sensitive for that. So uh, both sex uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines trigger depression, but uh, females are especially sensitive for administration of LPS, uh, of the, the dipopolysaccharides from the E. coli, which is common microbe in the gut. And that may explain why prevalence of de depression is two times mo more prevalent in women than in men, because they are more sensitive for uh, that. And it's also interesting that vaccination against typhoid cause symptoms of depression for otherwise healthy person. And when I came here to Brazil, just before I visited a doctor in Finland, and they recommended that I should take typhoid uh, vaccine when I came uh, Brazil, but I said, no, no, I don't want to get depressed because there is a high odds that we will get a depression after that, and the odds to have two points is so small, there's no sense to take it. And uh, also, it's interesting that uh, when people have given cytokine antagonist and an anti inflammatory agents at the same time, it's a blocked development of sickness behavior, which we call as a depression. And uh, so, there's a lot of evidence. And these are in humans, but there is even more evidence in other animals. So if we activate immune system in ro uh, rodents, it causes uh, sickness behavior, which is very similar to depression. So what we call it uh, as depression is actually, from, from zoological view, it's a sickness behavior. And so uh, psychiatry is not real science, it's pseudoscience. So, uh, you, <laughs> That's, that's the truth. So you should not look to uh, symptoms, you should see what triggers them. And that's why uh, the diagnosis of depression is not scientific because it's the sickness behavior caused by, by uh, neuroinflammation. And uh, during the years, there's uh, millions of euros used to find genes that make um, uh, people depressed and because they were thinking that Depression is caused by too low serotonin level, so they uh, look at genes, how those genes affect in serotonin system are associated with depression, but there's no association between those. Instead, they have found there's a lot of genes which are associated, but those genes uh, which are associated with depression are genes that play a role in immune function. And it seems that those uh, genes make people more vulnerable, uh, like to have low-grade inflammation. So, and uh, so there is a lot of evidence for that, uh, that. So it seems that the inflammation, uh, actually we made a hypo uh, hypothesis in our article that uh, it seems that, that inflammation make previously adaptive mood change to become clinical depression. It's mixed sickness behavior with adaptive mood change and, uh, and uh, it may, might make uh, the, the group of symptoms maladaptive to solve that problem which uh, with triggered that depression. And it also seems that low-grade inflammation makes symptoms stronger than it is good for the person. And uh, now it, there is also uh, empirical evidence for our hypothesis. They made a study in USA where they uh, took a blood sample from uh, people who get widowed recently and they found out that those who had low-grade inflammation, they have stronger uh, symptom of grief, grief and long, uh, more symptom of depression and they were more likely to get depressed after uh, be, uh, they become widowed. And um, so this suggests that it's actually that low-grade inflammation 
but what make the Western people more like to uh, occur depression after tra tragic events of life. And uh, there is also correlative evidence so that when people have measured uh, uh, different variables of uh, low-grade inflammation, it has been found that those who have low-grade inflammation, they have much more high to develop depression. For example, it was found that uh, risk of major depression increased by 44 percent for each standard deviation increase in logarithmic CRP. So, of course, there is many other markers of depression, and maybe CRP protein is not the best one because there is at least 100 different pro inflammatory cytokines, and it seems that different people. It, uh, uh, that activation of the immune system might have a little bit different immunological profile. But uh, the end products, the neuroinflammation, seems to be very similar. So probably in the future, uh, patients with uh, our depressed, they put them first to the brain scanner and they look whether they have neuroinflammation or not. And uh, also the, one of the best evidence comes from the studies where they have keen anti cytokine treatments for uh, depressed patients, and they have shown to be much more effective than antidepressants. Actually, I didn't uh, update. It was recently published a meta analysis with more than 30 different studies, and uh, we were placebo controlled, and they, it shows that the, those uh, anti cytokine treatments were much more effective than antidepressants. It's funny that medical doctors say that there is not enough evidence, but actually there is huge evidence. But uh, they are not so interested to uh, uh, sus subscribe anti cytokine treatment for patients because um, medical companies support anti providing antidepressant, not uh, and those uh, anti inflammatory agents. So, interesting thing is. Why does inflammation cause mood change that turn to maladaptive states of clinical depression? So what is the uh, ultimate mechanism behind that? We understand the approximative mechanism quite well. So microglia cells in the brain are not able to recognize whether the source of pro-inflammatory cytokines that enter the brain are a result of health problems caused by modern lifestyle or by infection. Uh, so, if the amount of primary cytokines is high enough, they trigger sickness behavior. Previously, the inflammation was caused by microbes or worms, and uh, that uh, sickness behavior helped save energy for the use of immune system. But now, if you are obese, your body produces pro-inflammatory cytokines, but there is no infection, so that uh, sickness behavior won't help the person, and that's, that's a result of environmental mismatch because we live in different kind of environment. Uh, I mean, we are adopted uh, to eat uh, food that has a lot of sugars and fat because in the evolutionary environment we, we didn't, ha didn't have enough uh, calories, and so we, our mind evolved to like eating those, but nowadays we can eat too much of them and become, become obese, and obese, obesity increased the uh, risk of uh, depression a, long, uh, a lot, but of course there is other source of inflammation. Uh, so this sickness behavior uh, uh, in women and other animals, uh, it uh, has the same uh, symptoms. For example, it means uh, loss of appetite, it uh, causes psychomotor retardation, it causes at least Sleep disturbation, it's got energy, anhedonia, weakness, malice, listlessness, hyperalgesia, impaired concentration, and social isolation. So these symptoms help against infection, but they do not help you if you have chronic stress because of bad mar marriage or if you uh, got uh, unemployed and you won't have financial problems, the uh, 
chronic stress may produce these symptoms and, uh, and of course they won't help person anymore. So that's why we could say that it's clinical depression because it's not adaptive for a person anymore. But in the case of uh, if you have microbial infection, these are good for your body uh, because it's better to rest and uh, allow your body to he heal. So, and when these uh, symptoms of sickness behavior are combined with an adaptive mood change, they may become maladaptive. So inflammation may enforce these symptoms and cause symptoms that do not help to resolve the adaptive problem that triggers the mood change. So, the, the treatment of depression should focus treating the underlying causes of depression rather than treating the symptoms. And of course, it would be important uh, to uh, reduce inflammation so that uh, it would reduce the risk of new depressive episode. And uh, if, uh, depending on what is the triggering factor, you should have a little bit different kind of treatment. And uh, so that intervention should be tailored individually based on patients' subject of depression. And it's also important to note that sometimes you might meet many different triggering factors, like you may, may uh, uh, feel loneliness because you lost your spouse and, uh, and you may also lose your job because of that. And they may trigger different uh, uh, modules in the brain. It seems that uh, this might be even be different modules in the brain and if they are, are activated at the same time, they may produce combinations of, of the symptoms that uh, actually make the situation uh, less uh, good for a per person. And uh, so anyway, just looking at those triggering factors and you can tailor best possible uh, treatment for each patient. And uh, if you look this uh, treatment from evolutionary point of view, we should uh, reduce the odds that we will get depression and also treat depression the same way uh, which uh, help those hunter gatherers to avoid uh, depression. So we know that uh, chronic stress play an important role on those, and studies have shown that uh, hunter gatherers do not suffer from chronic stress. Somehow they lifestyle uh, uh, protect against chronic stress. Of course, they experience stress because stress is adaptation, which helps uh, us to uh, cope with the situation, which enhance our performance during that particular moment. But it shouldn't be chronic. And so, and, uh, so they don't have chronic stress. They move much more during the daytime than uh, we do. I think, if I remember correctly, men run something like 20 kilometer every day and uh, when they do hunting. And so they do get much more exercise than we do. And we know that exercise is effective treatment against depression. The latest meta-analysis say that if you walk half an hour, three times a week, it's more effective than antidepressants. And uh, so we know that uh, diet has long, uh, strong influence on that because it's influence on gut microbiome, which is one source of, of uh, inflammation. And of course, uh, th there's other sources of inflammation, like uh, if you have a problem with teeth, it may cause inflammation. And it uh, may be cause also depressive symptoms. And, and also, they don't uh, use similar drugs than we do. Of course, they had drugs, uh, but uh, not, uh, as a, they didn't use it as the same way that people nowadays use. And, and uh, they did spend a lot of time outdoors, especially in the bright light. It, for two, this, uh, for uh, Brazilians, this doesn't, it's not so interesting, but for example, in Northern Finland, you won't see sun for three months during the winter, so it's quite easy to understand the amount of bright light plays a role. And uh, they, did, uh, they do sleep more than uh, average Western people. And uh, we know that uh, working in the forest and uh, uh, being exposed to nature reduce stress, and that's uh, also important factors. They, are, they don't use social media. Uh, social media is known to cause stress for many people, and they have also more social life. 
So I hope you like this view to depression, and I recommend you to read this. This book is, this is e e excellent, and I hope that my book will be published soon in e English. It's under peer review to find uh, American pub publisher. So uh, uh, let's hope that they like it. So thank you. Do you have any questions about depression? So they, they calculate in USA that it estimated that about half of people will get depressed during their lifetime. So you, uh, at least half of you will be depressed in some point of the, in your life. And it's possible that because the am amount of depression is increasing very fast, it m might be even higher. Yeah. So during that time, remember that there is different subtypes and they should be treated different way and there is many more options than, than just using antidepressants, which actually are problematic because if you start to use them, you are, might not be able to uh, uh, give them, uh, to finish uh, using them. And also th there is one interesting side effect. If you use antidepressant, then exercise won't make you feel better. So that's why it may be problematic to use those because then you are not able to use those uh, natural methods to alleviate uh, depression. go the first question and if it's if it's wrong just tell me okay uh, the first is actually to conceptualize or explain and define better depression right what actually what would be the conceptualization of, of depression so that it would fit to humans and also non-human species okay. yeah. yeah there's a list of Symptom is DSM-5, and if you have uh, at least four of them, then you will be mildly depressed, and if you have six, or more than six, you are uh, average, and then if you have more than eight, then you are severely depressed. So this, they include like low mood, uh, loss of appetite, or change in appetite in general, uh, uh, and uh, change in uh, amount of sleep, and uh, physical, uh, slow loneliness or and uh, pessimism and uh, suicidal, suicidal talks and so on. So there is specific list, but that's completely arbitrary. So there is no scientific uh, basis why they have chosen those symptoms because there is there's also other symptoms that are common in, in depression, but they haven't included. And there is no scientific evidence why you should have four symptoms, why three is not in enough for diagnosis. So the problem is that psychiatry is not real science, it's, it's uh, just uh, pseudoscience. So that's why uh, we need evolutionary psychology to provide theoretical background, because now there is a lot of just hypothesis with, without any connection in psychiatry, and that's why they haven't been able to uh, develop effective treatment for any mental disorders. It's actually funny that even they have used millions of euros uh, to study those, they, they, have, they are not able to cure any mental disorder right now. But with evolutionary psychology, we can cure actually quite many of them. We can cure uh, major depressive disorder, we can cure bipolar disorders, schizophrenia, and anxiety disorder. And I hope that you are convinced about that. So I have tried to met, uh, to apply that evolutionary uh, psychological uh, treatment of mental health problems. And uh, I hope that this is the treatment which will be popular in future. Because it hasn't had any bad side, side effects. If they, they don't help, then 
I think that nobody is harmed if they eat more healthy and if they do exercise if, and if they take got different therapies and so on. But if you use antidepressants, they increase or that you will do suicide for 10 times. There is this meta-analysis to show that. So, uh, and they also cause many other kind of physical problems. So like it has been shown that they may cause erectile dysfunction for men and they reduce uh, people's ability to fall in love and they may cause uh, stomach problems and uh, they um, cause problems with teeth and so on. There's a lot of side effects. And, you can, and if you buy the pills, bottle of it pills, there is a list of those that's it. Uh, so it's easy to see that it's not my own opinion. The, the medical doctors also know that they have a lot of side effects. Okay. <clears throat> the second was, question was that racism actually wasn't included among the factors that might influence depression. So how racism, because in many countries, right, there are groups of people who are treated as the, if, if they had lower value than the majority or than the other people, so probably one of the stressors. Yes, uh, I didn't talk about racism because I come from Finland, it's less problem there. But um, uh, of course, racism is one source of stress. So there was one subtype, which is long term stress. and. And it doesn't matter what is the actual trigger. It's only if you have chronic stress, it's lead to dep depressive symptoms. But of course, there is like problem is financial problems, but of, of course, racism is maybe important in this kind of place uh, where there is many ethnic groups. I have to actually add that to my new book. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't talk that aspect. Thank you. Other questions? I was thinking when, when you showed these um, recommendations, right, how to lower depression, the last one was to increase social contacts, but maybe it should be clear that actually uh, exchanging messages on cell phone and including many followers on social networks is not really the social life you are talking about, right? Yes, because what seems to be help is that if you interact with people, it produces oxytocin. And that oxytocin is known to reduce stress and it also reduces the function of amygdala, which is the place important role in stress system. And when you use uh, social media, you might think that you are social, but you won't get that so, uh, oxytocin response. Maybe you, maybe you get uh, dopamine when you see that you, there's a lot of followers, but it doesn't reduce your stress system uh, same way as if you would interact with real people. And the one reason why different therapeutic uh, system, psychotherapy and those actually help people is that uh, many people are lonely and they don't have anybody to talk so just by this, uh, to being able to meet person who is interested to hear what they are, uh, how they feel and so on it has been shown to reduce stress and uh, so that's the only uh, way to, to many people uh, to, uh, to reduce stress nowadays but of course there's many other ways to do but it would be more effective to have real friends who would be interested to about how they feel and so on. And of, sometimes dogs are actually quite uh, good uh, and other animals because when you uh, interact with them, it uh, also produces oxytocin and it alleviates stress. Yeah, that's right. There are actually studies on cats, right, and other pet owners who are actually healthier, mentally healthier than people who don't have any pets. That's that's nice. Yeah, I don't know if this works also with robots, actually. But anyway, that's what we will probably discover. So I guess that's it. We will have a small break, right? So let's have a small break, five, seven minutes, and we will continue with another topic, which is. But bipolar disorder, right.
Okay, so we will continue the, the series of lectures now on a lecture about the evolutionary psychological approach to bipolar disorder. Professor Marcos. Thank you. So, people, uh, researchers hasn't been able to curve uh, bipolar, dis bipolar disorder because it hasn't been known what causes bipolar bipolar disorder. And the reason why they didn't know it was that those uh, psychiatrists studying this topic were not interested about evolutionary psy psychology. Uh, so I hope that this, my talk will open your eyes to see what evolutionary psychology can provide for, for the treatment of bipolar disorder. So. I think most of you know that I don't need to tell so much about what is bipolar disorder because most of you are psychologists. So uh, there is uh, two different types of bipolar disorders. So the one uh, which uh, is type one and type two. And in one uh, type one there is mania, and in uh, type two there is hypomania, which is a little bit lower uh, in symptoms than that mania. But both of them have depression and. Uh, uh, you probably know also these manic symptoms, like uh, uh, sleeping v very little and acting recklessly and impulsively and feeling unnecessarily optimistic or extremely irritable and, or talking rapidly and uh, highly distracted. And uh, in hypomania, these symptoms are just a little bit lower. And uh, if you take any psychiatric textbook, they will tell that bipolar, di bipolar disorder is mainly heritable disorder uh, and environmental plays only a small role in it. Maybe it might be a triggering factor of mania, but they see it uh, like uh, heritable uh, disease. And uh, yes, there is studies to show that it's highly heritable, but recent studies suggest it's not as heritable as they say in textbooks. For example, in a study based on Swedish population register, which involved more than 8 million people, they, they found that there was 48,000 uh, bipolar uh, persons with bipolar disorder, and they were able to calculate that that heritability of the disease was 58 percent. So this doesn't mean that genes explain 50 percent, 8 percent of uh, about the risk to get uh, sick. Instead, it means that. It's uh, genes explain 58% of individual variation in the risk of uh, people, uh, polar disorder, and it's a completely different thing. And uh, when people have started to look this more carefully, they have found that those uh, genes that make people vulnerable for bipolar disorder, they also make them vulnerable for other men mental disorders. For, uh, for example, if close relatives suffer from bipolar disorder, the person has up to 97 to 92.9 times higher probably developing any mental health problem. So heritability factors that predispose to bipolar disorders also seems to predispose to other mental problems such as unipolar depression and schizophrenia. And uh, th there has been a lot of studies uh, where they have tried to find the gene that cause the bipolar disorder, but it seems that there's not a single gene that causes bipolar disorder. It seems that there's many genes that influence on the risk of bipolar uh, disorder, and each uh, of those genes has an only small effect on the risk of, of, uh, of the bipolar disorder. And what is interesting is that every one of us carries several of those genes, but only a couple of percent of us will get sick during their lifetime. So there is some kind of mismatch between those uh, studies. So if it's high to heritable, you would expect that there would be genes that make uh, you sick, and uh, you, you might be able to find medicine that uh, could base it on those genetic differences. But that does not seem to be the case. For example, there is 48 locus 
that has been associated with increased risk of uh, bipolar disorder. So uh, it's very difficult to develop drugs that would be based on, uh, on any of specific genes. And that's why they haven't been able to improve the treatment of bipolar de uh, depression for 50 years or something. They, all, they, uh, they still provide those uh, same drugs which are not so effective uh, for patients. And uh, this bipolar disorder is evolutionary paradox because studies show that it reduced fitness of, uh, of those uh, who have bipolar disorder. And uh, for example, a study in Sweden saw that they had fewer, less children than healthy people. And um, so why natural selection hasn't eliminated those genes or the locus that uh, make uh, us vulnerable for bipolar disorder? And to explain this, uh, we published a paper where we provided evolutionary mismatch model for a bipolar disorder. We don't call it is hypothesis anymore because there is evidence for that. Because hypothesis is when it, there is no evidence, but we were able to show evidence that bipolar disorder is caused by emerald mismatch. So there is a lot of geographic variation in prevalence of bipolar disorder. For example, a survey of 11 countries found that the lowest lifetime prevalence of bipolar disorder was in India, where it was only 0.023%, while the highest prevalence was observed in the USA. Uh, so the prevalence was almost 100 times higher in the USA than, than in India. That's actually quite weird to find this because when I read Psychiatric textbooks they say, they usually say that there is hardly any difference between uh, countries, but data does, doesn't support that. And uh, I, I, first I thought that it was only Finnish psychiatric textbook, but it seems to be a common mistake to think that there is no geographic variation. And uh, it actually might be interesting for you that highest prevalence in uh, bipolar disorder occurs in Brazil. And uh, I found a study uh, made in Pelotas in Brazil uh, which included 1,560 young adults and they found that prevalence of, uh, uh, of depression was almost 30%. So if you compare the prevalence of USA in that previous study, it's much higher. So, and I was wondering, this must be some kind of mistake, maybe uh, uh, it was 10 times more than it should be or something. But it seems to be not the case. It seems to be actually the, the, the real data because I found another study made by other researchers which were quite similar. So they found that in Sao Paulo, the, uh, the prevalence of bipolar disorder was 8.3%. So it, it seems that uh, uh, highest prevalence in the world occurs in Brazilian cities. It would be actually interesting to study this more because of Sao Paulo is so big city that it's maybe how you collect uh, that data, you might be get very different results. But uh, of course, psychiatrists with whom I have talked about this say that, okay, that's because there is more genes that make people vulnerable in Brazil. But that's not seems to be the case. Because the participants of these two studies were from several different ethnic groups and ethnicity didn't not have any statistical significant effect on risk of developing bipolar disorder. And interestingly, the lifetime prevalence of major depressive disorder in Sao Paulo has been prevalent to be exponentially high. It was 18.4%. It suggests that uh, those same environmental factors that increased the odds to have bipolar disorder also increased odds to, that people have major depressive disorder. And uh, if you look at the city, you might get a lot of hypotheses what might 
caused this. And today I was able to visit the downtown of that, and I got a lot of ideas what might, what, what would be those factors that increase that ought and the result of those. But one what we, which we know for sure is that uh, m many he mental health problems are mo more common in uh, big cities uh, than in the countryside. For example, in a uh, big study in Denmark that has a mil almost a million uh, uh, participants, they found that urban residents ha have almost 50% higher risk of developing psychiatric disorder, such as anxiety and mood disorder, compared to the rural counterparts. And uh, of course, not, uh, there is uh, more people uh, in uh, Sao Paulo than in whole Denmark, and those Danish cities are very different than Sao Paulo. But uh, there is much more studies on that topic, and they are published in very high quality journals, which shows that low exposure to nat nature and green spaces is associated with increased risk of bipolar uh, disorder. Of course, there is many other things like uh, inequality of wealth and, uh, and things like that, which may explain, but this is at least good hypothesis to uh, explain this. And uh, if we look hunter gatherers, we found very interesting pattern, because when researchers have studied dep depressive disorder, they haven't found any single case of bipolar disorder. Of course, you might say that maybe they, they were not looking uh, them uh, carefully enough, but they should have found at least those patients who have had uh, that depressive phase of their uh, 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 cycle, uh, cycle, but they didn't. So we could make good assumption that maybe bipolar disorder doesn't exist among hunter gatherers, and there is. Uh, very, very cool results because people uh, have been studying uh, the, uh, uh, those Kaluli people for more than 100 years and they have recorded all per, uh, deaths and uh, how many people have born and they have followed the mortality of the children and so on. Uh, but there is no even a single case of suicide recorded among those Kaluli people around 100 years of anthropological studies, despite the fact that they have a cause of, a recorded cause of death more than thousands of individuals. And we know that uh, suicides are very common uh, cause of death for patients with bipolar disorder. So this suggests also that uh, they, don't, they might not have so high prevalence of of um, those as in the Western world. And also, th that maybe the best evidence about effect of emotional factors comes from those people who still live traditional lifestyle, like those old or uh, Amis. That, uh, this was the study with which I was uh, present in my, next, uh, in my, my previous talk. The uh, Egeland Hoster surveyed the prevalence of mental disorders among uh, one um, Amish uh, population for five years it had one, 8,186 adults. And uh, what they found was very surprising because there was very few cases of mental health problems uh, overall and the uh, prevalence of bipolar disorder was 0.46% uh, and uh, that was a five-year prevalence usually uh, researchers only uh, say lifetime prevalence or one year prevalence. And if you compare one year prevalence with other Americans, it's uh, much uh, lower. Of course, it's difficult to compare one year prevalence with five year prevalence, but you can see the difference. And also, it's important to note that the way how they collected data was not similar at all. They ask people not better, only better they have depression or mental health problem, but they ask whether anybody, their family or their friends has mental health problems. And, if, and they found that everyone who had uh, bipolar disorder, at least 
people in their societies that, that they have mental health problems. So if, if somebody hinted uh, that uh, somebody has mental health, they started it, to study it more deeply. And they say that they found much higher prevalence of, uh, of people are disordered than it's typically found in that kind of study. So, and uh, so it's also uh, interesting that uh, it's not only among Amish where they have a low prevalence of bipolar disorder, but also in hot food territories, which also live a very old style uh, country life uh, in a in the uh, USA and in, in uh, southern Canada. And uh, researchers collected uh, big sample size in the uh, 1950s about mental health problems in these. And uh, it was found that among uh, 4,826 uh, uh, those uh, participants, there was only three cases of bipolar disorder, which suggests that the uh, four year prevalence of bipolar disorder was only 0.06%. And uh, so I think this shows very well that uh, environmental factor must play a role behind this disorder. And of course, there's more evidence for that. For example, uh, in China, where the rapid modernization of life has happened during the last decade, a meta analysis found that between 1984 and, and 2013, the one year prevalence of bipolar disorder more than doubled. So it's quite a big change if you think that, uh, uh, that uh, it's, uh, there is high heritability of the disorder. So something doesn't match here. So if uh, so psychiatrists view that it's you know, co uh, almost completely heritable, then uh, this shouldn't happen. And uh, this meta-analysis uh, includes uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, participants, so it's, it's very huge. And similar findings can be found around the world. So, for example, according to the, the data collected in the USA in the 60s and 70s, the lifetime prevalence of bipolar disorder was 1.2, and, uh, and in the World Health Organization study, it was found that it was uh, 2.5, which suggests that it's almost doubled uh, in prevalence. And also, there is similar kind of studies in uh, Sweden and, uh, and also in Ireland, which shows that prevalence of bipolar disorders has increased. And it's uh, interesting why. So, uh, psych uh, psychiatrist hasn't been any clue what causes bipolar disorder, but it has been known that uh, those patients with bipolar disorder, they have malfunction in their internal, internal clock. But nobody has been able to explain why and how it would cause those symptoms. So, I published with my research group uh, an article we, we, first, uh, we presented first time theoretical model which explains the bipolar disorder. We were able to uh, provide empirical evidence that Western lifestyle produces low-grade inflammation and that low-grade inflammation causes circadian clock dysfunction which reduces sleep quality and quantity which triggers mania, and mania leads uh, down regulation of stress system, which causes specific type of depression. And of course, genetic factors influence on the, the circadian clock dysfunction, and uh, also this interacts. And, but it's important to note that, of course, not all depressive symptoms of uh, patients with uh, bipolar disorder are similar. Also, they had adverse life events with uh, cause uh, those adaptive uh, uh, responses. And uh, so, uh, and now I saw some evidence. So there is a lot of meta-analysis uh, done where they saw that activation of immune system desynchronized circadian rhythm. There is uh, even studies in whom they have 
injected uh, pro-inflammatory pro cytokines and shown that it uh, desynchronized circadian rhythm. But somehow psychiatry didn't connect immune system with the mood disorder, so they didn't understand this link. And uh, nowadays there is a lot of evidence that also patients with bipolar disorders, they have neuroinflammation. And uh, so, so uh, for example, they have five markers of uh, inflammation in plasma and also in cerebrospinal fluids. And also brain tissue samples uh, collected from patients with uh, bipolar disorder show sign of neuroinflammation. But in contrast to bipolar, uh, to, to clinical depression, they, they, they're in the case, not make microglia cells are active, but instead they have uh, activated astrocytes. There are different group of immune cells in the brain. And uh, that may explain why somebody will get uh, depression and another one will get, uh, get uh, bipolar depression because uh, the, the brain's immune system uh, responds a different way. And there is a lot of meta-analysis and uh, reviews about that topic, so there's good evidence that this actually is the case. And we also known from psychological literature that uh, stressful life events are usually the common trigger of mania. But uh, those uh, researchers didn't connect that uh, stressful life event with neuroinflammation. But now we know that, that uh, stress itself is able to trigger neuroinflammation and cause that uh, problem with in internal clock in the brain. And uh, so there is also separate evidence to show that chronic stress itself is able to desynchronize circadian rhythm. And uh, there is a, uh, these are separate studies. And uh, interestingly, also cut microbiome seems to play a role in bipolar disorder. There is studies which shows that patients with bipolar disorder have apparent cut microbiome. I don't show you the list of species because it's very difficult to compare uh, different studies because if they are carried in different countries, people in different countries have a little bit different diet and they have a uh, little bit different microbiome and that makes it very complicated. But if we compare patients with bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder with uh, healthy controls, then we can see that they have different kind of microbiome. And that cut uh, dysbiosis which is a bit uh, bipolar disorder, it's known to increase stress insensitivity and glow rate inflammation. So uh, that uh, may be one of those root reasons behind bipolar disorder. And psychologists know that childhood experience increased the odds to have bipolar disorder and many men other mental health problems. But Psychologists do not know that the traumatic life events during the childhood, they change cut microbiome and they increase stress sensitivity. There is two mechanisms how they do it. It can cause epigenetic change to the amygdala or it can change cut microbiome. And actually it has been shown that traumatic childhood experience reduce amount of lactobacillus in the gut, and uh, those are those uh, uh, microbes which influence on stress sensitivity. And uh, there is evidence that if you provide those as, as a probiotics, they uh, alleviate stress. So this, uh, like I said, this is not hypothesis. This is based on all of these lines are based on meta-analysis. They are not. And the single one of them are based on a single study. So uh, let's hope that psychiatrists would be interested to read this and uh, start to uh, change their thinking about uh, this. For example, it's known that chronic stress causes sleeping problems, so there is interaction. This is pretty complicated, but uh, this it gives hope that maybe we someday might be able to provide more effective treatment and even heal uh, or cure completely uh, the bipolar disorder. If, if, if you know, know that, for example, uh, 
cut microbiome play important role if we can uh, change it and uh, if we can change the epigenetic changes in uh, amygdala and there's actually now studies in uh, in mice which has so been able to reverse those uh, epigenetic changes in amygdala caused by uh, childhood traumatic experience and uh, the, if you wonder why those uh, hunter caterers do not have bipolar disorder. And one reason might be that uh, chronic stress is very rare among hunter caterers. There are studies that have measured uh, stress level on those, and it seems that their lifestyle protects against chronic stress. Of course, they have stress because it's beneficial for them, but it enhances their performance, but their lifestyles protect against chronic stress. And there is evidence that they don't suffer about uh, chronic low-grade inflammation. Of course, they suffer from inflammation if they will get malaria or any other, uh, it's cause inflammation, but they don't have low-grade inflammation. And there is, there's only three studies here, but there's a lot of studies to show that their arteries are in excellent condition and they uh, they don't have cardiovascular disease and many other uh, disorders. It, are common, commonly caused by low-grade inflammation. So the conclusion is, uh, my conclusion is that evolutionary mismatch is the ultimate cause behind bipolar disorder and chronic stress and neuroinflammation are the main approximate mechanism behind bipolar disorder. And this neuroinflammation desynchronized internal clock and leads sleep problems. And if uh, that article which we wrote was huge, we even explain it that in, in a neurochemical level, so we know that if you force people to uh, stay up late, it produces dopamine, and dopamine uh, is the uh, factor which uh, causes uh, mania. And uh, but because uh, this is targeted for psychologists, uh, not for molecular biologists, I, uh, I leave uh, that. Uh, that to this uh, ultimate level of explanation. But if you are interested, I recommend you read my paper about that topic. So thank you. Uh, uh. This is completely different view, so it's very often very difficult to uh, have ideas how you should uh, criticize that because it takes a little bit uh, time to uh, understand. Yeah. But it's it's complicated, but it's possible to understand. So we could take five minutes break now and and change the slides. Now I think I uh, finally understand why the psychiatrists really don't like you, because you are a heretic, but it's fine. So let's have five minutes of break. And next one, next topic is? Uh, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, okay, great.
Okay, so let's start. I, I think I'm announcing more for those who are watching us online, but it seems that there are at least some people who are interested. So let's start with the next topic, which will be probably the last topic today, because I don't know if we will get to the other ones. And that's schizophrenia, so it's your word. Thank you. So I think if everybody knows what is schizophrenia, so I don't need to explain basics. But so it's uh, characterized by psych psychotic uh, uh, symptoms. And, uh, but of course, psychosis occur also in many other disorders than just in schizophrenia. So some patients with depression might have uh, symptoms of psychosis and also in bipolar or in mania, so they sometimes have psychotic features and also schizophrenic disorder. But if you want to have uh, provide good explanation for schizophrenia, you should be able to provide why psychosis exists in the first place. And uh, also patients with schizophrenia, they often have symptoms of depression. Most of them actually fulfill the uh, diagnostic criteria of, of clinical depression, but they don't get that uh, they, because the yeah, DSM-5 says that only you can have only schizophrenia diagnosis, not also bipolar uh, or other, but there's only one diagnosis at one time. And uh, if you read any psychiatric textbook, it says that schizophrenia is highly heritable disease and it provides 80% uh, of heritability. That's the most common uh, number I have seen. But somehow I'm very skeptic and I start to look whether it's possible because it sounds just too high to be true. And actually it's not true. When uh, I did a look uh, studies where they have used pyrivised monotypic uh, 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 concordance, it seems that uh, heritability is much less than what is stated in psychiatric textbooks. So when they have comp uh, compared identical twins with the odds that both of them will be uh, will have uh, schizophrenia, uh, the meta-analysis shows that it's only 28%. It's, it's very different from 80%. So it shows that uh, Schizophrenia is mostly caused by environmental factors. So there is a uh, need for paradigm shift in uh, psychiatry. And uh, so this is, was quite new uh, article. And uh, during the last decades, they have used one, hundreds of millions of euros to there's a gene that causes schizophrenia. And yet they have found a lot of genes, but not a single gene that causes it. Actually, they found 108 uh, gene, gene, genetic losses that are associated with the increased risk of schizophrenia. And uh, all of them provide a little bit thought to have schizophrenia. And if you combine the effect, they explain only about 2% of the risk to have schizophrenia. It's almost nothing. So interesting question is, what are those environmental factors that cause schizophrenia? And, uh, and uh, that schizophrenia m would have been evolutionary paradox because it reduced uh, number of offsprings and uh, preposterous in general very strongly. It has been estimated that they have on average 30 to 80 per, uh, percent lower re reproductive success compared to unaffected individuals. But because, the, because that uh, heritability is so slow, of course the selection would not be so strong against that. And of course they have high, higher mortality rate uh, for natural unnatural case. Uh, especially suicide are very common among schizophrenic patients. And, yeah, um, but anyway, we would uh, expect that 
that uh, schizophrenia genes that, and, and those alleles that increase the risk of uh, schizophrenia, they should be under negative selection. But what I talked when I start to read about this article, I, I immediately noticed that schizophrenia is not a single disorder, like it, was, it has been said in psychiatric textbook. Given the phenotypic uh, heterogeneity of schizophrenia and the assumed underlying genetic heterogeneity, the constructs of schizophrenia may not have discrete biological cause, but many rather represent an umbrella concept that conver con covers heterogeneous group of disorders. So the, uh, it's not very scientific to look only symptoms. Uh, it was uh, like people were treating schizophrenia a way like uh, medi if medical doctors would uh, label all disease that cause fever as fever, fever causing disorder. Of course, you should expect that different kind of uh, bacteria and, uh, they are able to cause the same symptoms, but they are separate uh, disorder. And that seem, seems to be the case also in schizophrenia. There is uh, patients which have completely different kind of symptoms uh, and uh, some symptoms are elevated with drugs, but not all of them. And uh, so it's much more complicated. And uh, also, I'm, because I'm a zoologist, I became interested that there, uh, those psychosis may occur on other animals. And it's been the case that it also occur in other animals. For example, it has been shown that in uh, mice, they have uh, auditory hallucinations, and uh, it's also associated with dopamine system, which is quite interesting. So if you start to look at this, this schizophrenia from a um, uh, zoological point of view, you will get very different conclusion what kind of, of uh, disorder is or disease is the schizophrenia. So because my background is in immunology and parasitology, I need to look uh, the cause of uh, schizophrenia from other source than from genes. And uh, actually it seems possible that it's caused by pathogens and now there is huge evidence to support that claim. It's interesting if you take any psychiatric textbook, they don't see anything, they don't say anything about potential role of parasites and pathogens behind schizophrenia. Expect, although there is a lot of meta-analysis on other shows that they do play a role, but they haven't been able to connect those symptoms with those diseases, but we make a model which would uh, explain the mechanism. So we know that toxoplasmosis has something to do with schizophrenia. And uh, this uh, toxoplasmos condi is obligate intracellular parasitic protozoa that causes disease, which uh, is called as toxoplasmosis. And it, uh, the T. condi is capable of infecting virtually all pormblood animals and, and felids such as domestic cats are the only def uh, definitive host which are, in which uh, the parasite is able to reproduce sexually. And uh, this is very common around the world. It has to be estimated in world by that about uh, 30 to 40 percent of uh, domestic cats are infected by this. And uh, for example, in the USA, it has been estimated, depending on the states, the, its prevalence varies from 16 per percent to 80 percent. And uh, that uh, T. condi is also very common uh, in humans, and uh, actually it's one of the most common uh, parasites around the world. And um, it has been estimated uh, that about 30 to 50 percent of global populace has been exposed and made chronically infected with T. condi. But the prevalence varies a lot between countries. And highest prevalence of uh, has been uh, found in France, where in some cities it has been found to be 84 percent, and uh, in prevalence in Finland it was only 20 uh, percent. So it's actually very, very common. And uh, there is uh, one map which shows that actually 
it's very gomos in Brazil. And uh, it's, of course, we don't have data for all uh, countries, but those which have, uh, have suggest that there is huge variation. And uh, in order to understand why it has influence on us, we need to understand the biology of that, that uh, parasite. So, the August uh, are set in domestic and wild fields, and the setting period is about 14 days. So, uh, it's probably in one to five days to uh, infective form, and, uh, and those cats who have uh, are infected, they have often no clinical signs of infection. So, if you have a cat and it's infected, uh, you are not able to see, but it's only able to spread that toxoplasm during the two weeks. And after that, it's immune against that. And uh, the problem is that because that parasite is only able to reproduce sexually inside the intestine of cat, so how can, can the parasite infect the next cat? And for that, it's used intermediate hosts who carry that, uh, for example, uh, when uh, uh, mice are exposed to fecus of cat and they, uh, and they will get, get that toxoplasmosis, it uh, uh, forms cyst inside the muscles and the brain, and when the cat eats it, then it infects a new host and uh, is able to reproduce again. But the problem is that we are also exposed on the cat fecus and uh, we may be exposed them through the uh, poorly washed uh, salads and, uh, and uh, uh, meat uh, which are not heated enough and it will get uh, also those cysts uh, inside our body and brain and uh, also domestic, other domestic an animals are exposed on that and uh, that's cause problem. Of course if you have cats indoors and you have lit uh, sand litter box for cats and you clean it and you are exposed on those. So it has been shown that uh, toxoplasmosis changes behavior in rodents. For example, infected uh, rodents has been shown to demonstrate lower innate fear response to cat pheromones and urine. Uh, and that's uh, very easy to explain why, because uh, it seems that parasites try to manipulate the host behavior so that it would be uh, it more, it, the odds that cat would eat the mice would be higher. And it's interesting that uh, it's not only that it uh, reduces the innate uh, fear against cat, but it has been shown that male rodents found that the cat urine is sexually attractive, so they just the company of the cats, and uh, of course, that's a uh, very effective way to increase risk that it will be eaten by mice, uh, eaten by cats. And uh, also, it, it has shown that infected rodents also demonstrate less learned fear to cat associated stimuli, and also uh, they have shown exact mechanism. We know very well how it do that. So the, the condi, when it's entered the brain, it's cause epigenetic modulation to the amygdala, and uh, this removes uh, the fear against cats, but it doesn't remove fear against other uh, uh, predators. So they still fear owls and dogs, and but they don't fear cats. So it makes sophisticated changes in brain neurochemistry. It's very beautiful way how evolution works. And they were able to show that the uh, fear of infected animals can be rescued by the systematic hypermethylation and decapitulation of the directed hypermethylation in the medial amygdala. So they understand the mechanism very uh, in the details. And, and the toxoplasmosis also increases uh, novelty seeking and reduce coordination, and that's also a very effective way to increase the risk that uh, that uh, rodent will be eaten by 
cats. So, uh, what do you think? Does uh, toxoplasma secondary influence behavior on humans? If you take any me medical textbook, they say that the to toxoplasmos infect is not harmful for human. But that's not seems to be, seems to be, seems to be case. There is uh, evidence that, uh, of course, we can um, have it from uh, different sources, like in the, uh, drinking or eating uh, food with has those orcus or uncooked meat, but a mother may infect fetus, and also you can get it from organ transplants, or you can uh, it, uh, get it from blood transfusion. But of course, those are quite rare, but it's possible. And uh, if you get it, uh, it has acute symptoms that are very similar to a normal flu. So it's very difficult to know whether you got just got a flu or whether you got uh, toxoplasmosis. But of course, there has fallen lymphal nodes. And, uh, but usually people do not notice that. And, uh, and when it's enter inside the body, it forms cysts the muscles, and uh, it stay dormant to wait until the cat will eat. Of course, domestic cats do not eat humans, but maybe uh, lions and jaguars or uh, other uh, felids. And uh, problem is that it also enters the brains, and uh, it's also from kissed inside the brain. And uh, of course, if uh, if uh, when it's enter, it cause problems, and uh, also it cause problems uh, if you get when in a very young age because they go inside the eyes and form cysts uh, uh, there, and it's reduced ability to see. And uh, if you wonder why it does that change, it might be actually adaptation because. If the same happens in mice, uh, it's increased odds that it will be eaten by cats. So in uh, humans, uh, if you uh, are infected when you were in the womb, it causes uh, several birth defects uh, like brain malformation, retinal disease, blindness, and learning disabilities. Nowadays, this is more rare than previously. Um, uh, for example, in USA, only one out of one to seven out of ten thousand birds are serology positive, and uh, and both of them have this disease. In many cases, uh, of course, it's lead uh, spontaneous abortion. But the um, problem is that the, when they enter brain, they actually can cause changes in the brain structure, and it's quite obvious that. If you have this kind of cyst in your brain, it must have some kind of effect. And uh, now there is, there is a lot of studies making checks uh, uh, where uh, they show that uh, the toxoplasmosis infection uh, has effect on human behavior. For example, chronically infected hosts have reduction reaction time and, and psychomotor performance, and they have reduced intelligent quantity and, and, and they have more they are more aggressive and they have higher impulsivity and uh, it was published 20 years ago uh, and uh, actually this study was published 20 years ago and it caused IQ Nobel uh, it's uh, if, because it, it sounds funny but actually it's a real important study uh, they found out that the toxoplasma increase risk of traffic accident. So they uh, took a blood sample and compared to the risk that a person has had traffic accident and they ha found that uh, they had, those who are seropositive uh, had 2.65 times higher risk of, of uh, having accident than those who were uh, toxoplasma negative. And interestingly, among those who had the highest concentration of, of uh, antibodies in their blood, they had 16 times higher odds to have a traffic accident, which is actually a huge difference. So this suggests that indeed 
toxoplasmosis may have effect on our everyday life. But I think the most interesting study uh, was uh, uh, done in Czech, uh, that they presented males different orders and asked them to rate their attractiveness. And they found that when men sniffed odor of cat pee, if they were infected by toxoplasmosis, they found it sexually attractive. But if they were not infected by toxoplasmosis, they found it aversive. So it seems that just like in mice, you know, so human, uh, the toxoplasmosis make males like uh, the odor of cat urine sexually attractive. And I, I think it's quite, quite cool results. And uh, interesting, that didn't happen in women. It's, of course, only in men. And that's also in, in mice. Only uh, males find cat urine uh, attractive, not females. So the effect is sex-specific, and it's very cool. And uh, most in interestingly, it was found also in chimpanzees that uh, when they did a study where they presented different odors to chimpanzees, those uh, chimpanzees uh, who were infected by toxoplasm, they found odor of uh, leopard uh, urine sexually attractive. So uh, it would increase the odds that chimpanzees would be eaten by, uh, by uh, leopard if, uh, uh, if a mess found uh, uh, leopard sexually attractive and they would like to approach them because of that. And uh, so it seems that in studies that those men who have toxoplasmos positive they lo love cats more, and uh, yeah. And if you think why they love it, they find it sexually attractive. It's a little bit aversive to think about that. But anyway, uh, uh, it seems that toxoplasmosis also plays role in schizophrenia. There, nowadays, there is at least more than 60 studies that all the information, which have uh, tested whether there is associates between schizophrenia and toxoplasmosis. But it's important to remember that if there is statistical as association, it doesn't prove causality. But anyway, these are very interesting. This is actually one artist who did, uh, drove uh, cats, and uh, this is when uh, he started to gradually change more psychotic. So this, see, he says that this is still a cat in that picture, but it's interesting. Uh, many artists had uh, schizophrenia in history. And uh, so the uh, problem is that there is huge variation in studies done. Some studies have ha hard, find hardly any associate between toxoplasmosis and schizophrenia, and some of them has found very strong association. For example, this study, they did a look uh, effect of uh, how, how uh, toxoplasmosis is associated with risk of, uh, of uh, schizophrenia, and they found that those who had uh, toxoplasmosis, they had 34.5 times higher risk of schizophrenia compared to uh, those who were seronegative. It's, and if you calculate the prevalence of, of uh, schizophrenia is about 2%, then you can easily calculate that if you are, have toxoplasm, you have very high odds to be schizophrenic. But it's interesting that in some other studies, there had been all maybe two times or three times higher odds. And uh, that's why psychiatry hasn't been interested about the topics because the, there is so much variation in that. But uh, it seems that there is good explanation for that. First is that there is genes that influence on the risk of, of uh, toxoplasmosis. And so that in most of cases, when you are infected by toxoplasmosis, your body are able to, your immune system are able to resist it, and it's not able to enter to your brain. Only a small proportion of individuals will have uh, that twist uh, in their brain. And uh, if you just measure amount, uh, the amount of antibodies in the blood, you are not able to spot who are those individuals who, who have a uh, twist in the brain and who doesn't have. And that may explain why they, uh, the association is weaker than expected. And also, 
they have shown that there's some genes that uh, make people vulnerable for toxoplasmosis. And uh, also, when I start to read this, uh, I notice that there is different subtypes of toxoplasmosis. And not all of those subtypes are able to uh, recognize in those antigen tests that they take from blood. So it's give underestimation of toxin positive patients. And it seems that uh, the prevalence of those subtypes uh, varies between countries. And that may explain why, like in this study, it's, it was made in Iran, they found very strong association. And in studies made in France, they find very low association. And uh, there is a uh, strongest evidence to show the link between schizophrenia and toxoplasmosis uh, uh, in uh, those studies which have uh, done brain scanning because those uh, studies have found that only in those patients which have toxoplasmosis, they have uh, brain changes that are typical for schizophrenia. So uh, there is uh, patients uh, with schizophrenia who have uh, doesn't have those uh, brain changes, but they're usually toxin-free. So it seems that, like I say, that toxoplasmosis, that uh, schizophrenia is not single disorder. It's, there is different type of, and uh, it seems that some types of schizophrenia are associated with toxoplasmosis. And uh, meta-analysis based on those 50 studies, they found that uh, that pre prevalence of uh, the, the risk of uh, of uh, of uh, Schizophrenia is increased by two to three percent, which is quite low. But if you compare it with, uh, with uh, any genes that uh, has been found, which is usually uh, to nine percent to twenty-five percent, uh, which is pretty small. Uh, and the uh, problem is that these studies haven't been ab able to identify what subtypes of of uh, toxoplasmosis uh, person has. And now studies have shown that only certain subtypes of, of uh, toxoplasmosis are able to cause schizophrenia. Some, uh, uh, some uh, are very neutral for women. And, and, uh, uh, and that's explain why only a small percent of patients with toxoplasma develops schizophrenia, because no, most of them have uh, less attractive uh, subtype of that. And uh, there, uh, in the Western world, there is three uh, common subtypes. And uh, for example, type one is associated with high levels of virulence in mice, and uh, type two, uh, two is uh, avirulent in mice. But this is also most prevalent uh, human patients with toxoplasmosis. And there is type 3, which is common in, in Europe and uh, North America. But it seems that only this type 1 is the one which causes schizophrenia. And, uh, and uh, so far, there is only one study that uh, separates uh, the different effects of toxoplasmosis. And it's found that when they were able to identify which subtype, uh, the effect was five times uh, stronger to associate between toxoplasmosis and schizophrenia. And uh, the good thing is that uh, this doesn't only so associate them, but we are able to provide explanation why toxoplasmosis causes psychosis. So in uh, studies in, uh, with uh, petridis, uh, with uh, mammalian neural cells, they have been able to show that uh, toxoplasmosis produce dopamine. And uh, we know that dopamine is involved with pleasure and pleasure and attention, but uh, dopamine is also uh, elevated in uh, the psychosis. And uh, those antipsychotic drugs usually are anti, uh, antagonist to dopamine. And they have shown that uh, toxoplasmosis has two genes that that uh, synthesize uh, tyrosine, which is the, uh, uh, used uh, to produce dopamine. So, and, uh, so interesting thing is why toxoplasmosis 
produce dopamine, and this seems that its function is actually dampen the immune system of the host. And uh, also, it seems that uh, it's the way how it manipulates the host behavior. And, uh, and uh, it's also interesting that the distribution of those cues in the brain is, some, uh, is quite random. And uh, that's why it may explain why not all symptoms are si similar in each patient, because uh, if it's, they are located in different places, it may cause a little bit different kind of hallucinations. And so if there is auditory hallucination, depends whether the cues are located in the auditory part, and if they are visual, it uh, needs to be in a, a visual uh, part of the uh, brain. And, uh, and uh, this uh, probably would also explain why uh, only a small proportion of people have that, because if you don't have cues in the certain part, part of the brain, of course, you would not be able to cause those problems. And interesting question is why, this is the evolutionary experiment, why toxoplasm make us crazy? So uh, it's possible that uh, evolutionary history we were the host, uh, intermediate host for toxoplasm, uh, uh, so that uh, our ancestor were more likely to be eaten by uh, lions and uh, other felids in Africa and, uh, and uh, by manipulating our behavior that toxoplasmosis did increase the cause that it would end up, the, uh, end up by eaten by lions or other uh, felids. But also it's possible that it's just byproducts that the main host is, uh, is a domestic cat and uh, it's try to manipulate mice, but sometimes it's end up to the humans and it still tries to do some same changes in humans than it uh, does in uh, mice. But uh, interestingly, those uh, drugs, which is commonly used to schizophrenia, they have also shown to influence on T. condi. So it's, some of those drugs prevent the cell innovation and the replication of this. Uh, and uh, actually, people didn't know to uh, what is the mechanism how this helps the, to alleviate the symptom of, of schizophrenia, but now we know that they influence on toxoplasmosis. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have drugs that specially target toxoplasmosis, uh, so, uh, because it was, has been talked that it's not harmful for people. Medical companies have been trying to find, but now we, because we know that uh, it plays a role in, in uh, schizophrenia, it would be interesting to start to develop uh, drugs which specially try to target toxoplasmosis. And in uh, rats, they have been able to show that if they keep antipsychotic medicine uh, for uh, toxoplasmosis infected rats, like, uh, like hal hal haloperi or, or dapson or valproic acid, it's reduced their, uh, uh, their uh, those uh, behavioral traits that are caused by manipulation uh, by toxoplasmosis. So uh, it's uh, quite interesting. And uh, in humans, they have also said that uh, toxoplasmosis is strongly associated with risk of suicide. So that uh, those who have toxoplasmosis, they have 54% higher or to attempt suicide and twice as like to suicide and uh, also the way how they do suicide are more violent than they have toxoplasmosis. And, uh, and uh, it, they have also been able to show that, uh, that the level of uh, how many antigens they have is also associated with the uh, risk so that those with have highest level of antibodies were 91 percent more likely to attempt suicide than uninfected women. And and the connection between parasite and suicide health, and for the women who had no history of mental illness among them, infected women were 56% more likely to commit self-directed violence. And uh, so if you wonder why uh, toxoplasma penetrates eyes, it's possible that in evolutionary history, it has increased odds that person will be eaten by, 
by lions and other uh, uh, predators with, with hunt humans and with were the main host of that um, toxoplasmosis. And uh, so it's important to remember that we are animals and we previously we were important food for lions and leopards and other cats. Uh, and uh, so in Africa, Toxoplasmosis is still very common in, among those big cats, so almost all of them are seropositive. And uh, of course, nowadays they don't hunt humans anymore because uh, humans hunt them and they are almost uh, extinct. But um, maybe that was the case before. And uh, there's also a very cool thing uh, what toxoplasmosis is causing humans. It was recently. Uh, found that uh, toxoplasmosis influenced the bird ra uh, sex rate in the in bird. So that uh, usually uh, there is about 50% of men and 50% of women. It's actually 0 0.551. So, but to in among those women who are uh, seropositive in uh, toxoplasmosis, they produce many more boys than girls, it's uh, to 72%, which is actually whose effect. And uh, women with highest concentration of this toxoplasma antibodies have offspring with sex ratio of 260 boys to 100 girls. And this is actually very strong effect. And uh, this is actually quite cool way how uh, that uh, toxoplasma is ma manipulates its host because because uh, the prevalence of toxoplasma in mothers of children with Down syndrome was found to be 84 percent, like in control population it was only 32 percent. So it seems that toxoplasmosis seems to relax stringency of fetus quality control in WOMP. It was, it may increase the probability that uh, bringing the toxoplasma infected children with developmental defect to full term. So it seems that it might be adaptive for toxoplasmosis to uh, produce more uh, children and a reduced amount of uh, spontaneous abortation, because usually spontaneous abortation will get rid of the, the toxoplasmosis, but it reduces them and that causes a change in sex ratio. And that's, that's statistically very strong effect. And uh, interestingly, uh, that parasites may also manipulate our mate choice. In, in many species, males typically, uh, the females typically avoid infected males, uh, like I uh, yesterday told you. But that's not the seem, seems to be the case in a sexually transmitted disease, because uh, so natural selection would prefer to those. Uh, disease uh, and those uh, genes that reduce uh, the harm caused for host because if the host is not able to uh, get uh, sex partners then it's not able to infect new individuals and uh, it has been shown in rats that uh, toxoplasmosis is sexually transmitted disease so uh, in this um, sperm they have those uh, toxoplasma condi uh, uh, and uh, and uh, it seems that uh, so, um, males are able to infect females. So if males is seropositive in toxoplasma, so it's able to infect females. And interestingly, they found that that toxoplasma make males more attractive for females. So it's manipulate. Uh, it's a uh, host to become more attractive so that it would be able to infect more individuals. And, uh, and they were able to show the mechanism that, that toxoplasmosis uh, goes inside uh, male's testes and activates leading cells to produce more testosterone. And uh, that, that testosterone uh, uh, level increases and it makes them more attractive for female. And uh, so it seems that uh, 
uh, it's increased testosterone level that make them more uh, attractive uh, and they get more mating and it's enhanced transmission of the parasite. And another wrote how it uh, make um, uh, increase the odds that, uh, that it will be infect cats is that it's uh, uh, would uh, reduce the fear of males and uh, the, the, uh, the odds that it will be eaten by cats. So there is two different strategy how that uh, parasites can increase its uh, fitness by man manipulating host. One is increasing its uh, attractiveness, another is reducing the uh, aversion against uh, the predators. And uh, th there is uh, studies in humans which suggest that uh, to toxoplasmosis increases testosterone level uh, in humans and, uh, and uh, especially during the latent infection when there is uh, uh, no activation in the immune system testosterone level is increased. And also it uh, causes a difference in uh, testosterone level changes during the day. So the testosterone level are highest uh, usually during the morning hours and then it, it declines with the time. But uh, those who have toxoplasmosis it goes a little bit different way. So it's interesting. And uh, uh, it has been found in checks that, that uh, those males who are toxoplasmos positive that they are more uh, masculine and dominant because the effect of testosterone. And uh, composite phase uh, shows that those men who are toxoplasmos positive they are more uh, uh, masculine. And uh, we did a study in, uh, in uh, Mexico where we uh, screened toxoplasmos from the blood sample of the biology student and uh, then we took photos from them and we found out that those who were infected by toxoplasmos, uh, those men were more attractive and also women who were uh, toxoplasmos infected, they were more attractive. And uh, we also found that those males who had toxoplasmos, they have two times higher testosterone level than uh, those healthy ones. And uh, that's actually quite interesting. We also found out that uh, toxoplasmosis infection was associated with psychotic, psychotic personality traits, which uh, uh, also support hypothesis associated with schizophrenia. And uh, now studies also suggest that uh, toxoplasmosis in humans is sexually transmitted disease. So it's possible that it manipulates men to be, become more attractive because it would be able to infect more women. And uh, it's interesting that uh, it's not only make men attractive, but they change their uh, behavior. They have found that, that those men who are, uh, and women who are se uh, seropositive, uh, they are more often aroused by their own fear, danger, and sexual submission. Although they practice more commonly sexual activists than toxin plus free subject. And authors suggested that the later change can be related to fixes in the personality trait of novelty seeking and in ineffect subject, which potentially a side effect of increased concentration of dopamine in their brain. So like I told you before that schizophrenia is not uniform disease and there are different subtypes of schizophrenia and this means that only one subtype is associated with toxoplasmosis. So toxoplasmosis is not only explanation for schizophrenia but it's clearly uh, one among many. And uh, it's interesting that prevalence of these different subtypes varies between countries and uh, those different subtypes have different response on uh, medication and uh, inflammatory markers vary a lot between those patients. We know that uh, patients with schizophrenia, they have neuroinflammation, but uh, they, uh, different patients have a little bit different kind of neuroinflammation. And, and uh, in this, uh, interestingly, it's known that not psychosis not exist only among patients with schizophrenia, but it also occurs in a case where bacterial or viral infection is able to enter the brain. Like in a syphilis, it's known that if it's able to enter the brain, it's caused psychosis and some uh, uh, encephal encephalitis 
uh, if uh, it's cause very strong uh, inflammation in the brain is able to cause psychosis. But usually they are not uh, classified as, as schizophrenia, instead they are uh, classified based on the triggering factor. And uh, uh, the recent meta-analysis suggests that there is also other uh, pathogens that are associated with uh, increased risk of, of schizophrenia, uh, like genital herpes, porn disease, chlamydia, phenomena, and chlamydia spitaki. And uh, interestingly, some of them are very strongly associated with schizophrenia. For example, chlamydia spitaki, it has been found that the disease increased the risk of developing schizophrenia as much as 29.5 times. It's, it's very strong association. And uh, this uh, disease is spread by birds, and you can get it if you are in very close association with birds. And, and uh, the interesting thing is that this bacteria is able to enter inside your brain and remain there in a dormant state, but it's activated by stress and uh, it has been found to be uh, found in from the uh, autopsy samples from frontal lobes of schizophrenia patient and in Germany they were able to show that uh, and they were able to identify that patient with schizophrenia had uh, these uh, antibodies in the blood when they gave them antibiotics they were able to cure them from the schizophrenia uh, some of them get uh, all symptoms of schizophrenia away from all schizophrenia, schizophrenia while uh, in many it's just elevated symptoms but uh, anyway this looks like pr promising so it's actually uh, so that if there is infection and you are able to get, uh, get rid of it actually you may be able to cure schizophrenia and there is also one uh, uh, pathogen that is also very strongly associated with schizophrenia for example in the case study, human patients diagnosed with rapid onset of schizophrenia, they found that Bartonella Hensley infection, uh, and uh, when they gave him uh, antimicrobial chemotherapy, uh, he was able to cure from that. And uh, this uh, Bartonella is bacteria which is uh, spread by cat. So when it, if you are scratched by cat, you may get that and uh, if you have poor immune system it's uh, able to enter inside your brain and uh, recent study found that uh, which took the 17 people with uh, uh, schizophrenia they found that 13 of them had this partner infection so uh, and only one from the control group which suggests that there is quite strong associates between this partner uh, so like I said that it's possible that it's, uh, schizophrenia is not single disorder. It seems that it's a group of disorders. Some of them are caused by toxoplasmosis. Some of them are caused by partenola. Some of them are caused by chlamydia spittaki and so on. And uh, then we uh, published a model which explains the uh, etiology of uh, schizophrenia. This is the first model to suggest uh, what causes schizophrenia. We, were able to provide evidence that uh, in order to have schizophrenia, you need to have pathogen, you need to have, uh, have genetic uh, vulnerability for schizophrenia, and then chronic stress is able to trigger because chronic stress uh, seems to uh, activate microglia cell in the brain, and that causes toxoplasmosis to produce dopamine in order to dampen that microglia cells and that's what causes psychosis. And in the case of chlamydia spittaki, it's the same. When if you have uh, dormant uh, chlamydia spittaki uh, cells in your brain, then uh, chronic stress are able to uh, trigger that. And that's also the case in Partenola. And we were able to say that contemporary li Western lifestyle increased the risk of chronic stress and also cut dysbiosis and childhood arthritis, they all influence on that. And so if you want to cure uh, and or treat patients with schizophrenia, so reduce chronic stress because it's known that chronic stress is often a uh, triggering factor of psychosis and that's because it interacts with pathogens. I recommend you read our paper about that. It was published last month, so it's quite a new article. It was published in Neuroscience Behavior Reviews. It was 
massive article. It's, as a manuscript, it was 80 pages long. So uh, we explain this in very details, uh, all the mechanism behind that. But I have to tell you a very interesting fact about schizophrenia. They have found in Pacific Islands and other populations that, that uh, the food what they eat might play an important role behind schizophrenia. Actually, they found that uh, in grain fee population had extremely rare occurrence schizophrenia, only two uh, person in 65,000 uh, person, but uh, while in the in Western world, uh, prevalence varies from one to, to two percent. And uh, they were able to say when uh, people adopted uh, Western diet in those Pacific Islands, the prevalence of uh, schizophrenia became common. So they were able to show the link between uh, diet and uh, schizophrenia. And uh, that matched very well with our, our, our model so that the Western lifestyle increased uh, chronic stress. And, uh, but also it's possible that uh, at the same time the cats uh, arrived there because they start to uh, 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 cultivate uh, wheat, which uh, also needs uh, cats in order to protect uh, your uh, harvest. And uh, interestingly, they have found uh, associated between celiac disease and schizophrenia. And so that uh, those who have celiac disease, they have increased risk of schizophrenia. And uh, they have also shown that gluten, which is one uh, of those compounds in, in uh, in gluten uh, seems to um, uh, produce antibody response in the body and uh, when they uh, compared uh, prevalence of antibodies in the blood for a patient with uh, uh, schizophrenia, uh, to the, uh, they found that many, 86% of patients with schizophrenia had antibodies against gluten by uh, normal uh, voluntary, it, uh, in uh, children it was only 3% and normal adults it was 34%. It means mean that uh, gluten sensitivity seems to be associated with schizophrenia. And also case casein, which is uh, protein in the milk. And this suggests that uh, patients with schizophrenia have leaky gut syndrome so that uh, those uh, food molecules are able to penetrate through the gut wall and activate the immune system. And, uh, and there is more studies uh, about that topic which show that, for example, clearly antibodies were 5.5 times more uh, common in, uh, in those, uh, those uh, who had recent, uh, recent psychosis compared to those uh, controls. And, uh, and also, Another study found that uh, study involving 1,400 people with schizophrenia and 900 healthy controls that high clearly antibodies were found in 20.1% of, of people with schizophrenia, but only 3.5% of the healthy controls. And so it seems that uh, diet has uh, something to do with schizophrenia, and that's because it's influenced on the uh, chronic stress and uh, now there is studies to show that uh, schizophrenia patients have deviant gut microbiome and, uh, and, and they have often inflammation in uh, intestine and uh, this inflammation in inf intestine increases stress sensitivity and may explain w why, uh, why they develop uh, schizophrenia. And, uh, and uh, there is a nowadays mechanism function how this uh, gut microbiome influence blood brain barrier. So it's possible that if you have gut problems, then it's e easier the microbes to enter your brain. And uh, that may be, uh, provide the link between schizophrenia and, and your diet. And also, they have found that when they have given uh, 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 transplants from the uh, schizophrenia patients to mice, uh, that uh, those mice who, who got the uh, fecal transplants from 
uh, sick individuals, uh, they, uh, their, their uh, behavior did change, and uh, those who got the transplant from healthy individuals, they didn't change, and they start to behave more like psychotic way, and, and those uh, who reside uh, their uh, fecal transplant from schizophrenic patient, they had also changed in neurochemistry with a little bit similar than uh, patient with um, schizophrenia. So it seems that there is some kind of connection between gut microbiome and schizophrenia, and our model explains what is the mechanism, and it's the, through the uh, effect of stress response. And interestingly, uh, Toxoplasma condi may explain the link. So there is a, a link between uh, Toxoplasma infection and gastrointestinal problem because Toxoplasma infection often uh, through the gastrointestinal tract and uh, penetrate through the wall of incestin uh, and it is able to increase gut permeability, uh, microbial translations and several inflammation. So uh, the, the way how people they get Toxoplasmosis may explain those changes in um, gastro microbiome, and also it may explain why they have inflammation in the gut. And, uh, and there is now evidence that Toxoplasmosis is gut, gut microbiome. And, uh, and they, for example, in mice, it has found that chronic Toxoplasma infection alters composite of the intestinal microbiome as long as five months following the infection. So thank you for your attention. I hope you uh, like this very different view to uh, schizophrenia. It's possible this is not correct and maybe it's just um, we need to uh, make a better uh, model, but I think that is much better than the idea that it's completely caused by genes and, and uh, if you are a patient with schizophrenia, you are not able to do anything else than eat drugs. But this suggests that if you have uh, uh, schizophrenia, by elevating chronic stress, you are able to reduce the uh, symptoms and maybe someday it might be possible to get rid of that parasites or pathogens which are in your brain and, and I hope that Psychiatrists will be interested to start to study that aspect in the future. So thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, as we were talking, I, if I'm not mistaken, I was thought that there are actually three types of schizophrenia, but they are classified by long-term symptoms that uh, are side effects of psychotic breaks. And with the advent of, of antipsychoticis, these long-term symptoms does not appear, and then we cannot categorize the kind of schizophrenia patients have. So based on all the information we have about these subtypes, they come from before the creation of antipsychotics. And the most common type of schizophrenia was catatonic schizophrenia, which had very similar symptoms with syphilis, and usually including the name schizophrenia is modern, the old name was precocial dementia, because this, it had these symptoms that were syphilis like and the, it was thought that both the cause and the treatment of syphilis and schizophrenia should be the same one, but then this theory was discarded. And do you know anything about that? What do you think about this? Yes, indeed, uh, it, it was known and it's still people know that syphilis cause psychosis, but because antibiotics that uh, has, it's not common anymore because usually people spot schizophrenia, that's a uh, syphilis before it's uh, are able to in enter in inside the brain. And uh, interestingly, catatonic uh, schizophrenia was much more common in Europe previously. Now it's quite rare. It's still common 
in uh, Africa and other parts of Japan. But, and I think that one reason is that people have started to uh, treat uh, those uh, microbial infections with antibiotics, and uh, that's why. But uh, it seems that catatonic uh, schizophrenia is not associated with toxoplasmosis, as associated with those uh, bacterial infections. So it would be very interesting to do a study and screen those different uh, patients with different symptoms and look how well you can predict which uh, pathogen they have just by looking symptoms. But the problem is that medical doctors and, and uh, psychiatrists, they are not interested about parasites and pathogens any, at all. So um, there is a huge paradox, or huge paradigm is needed before they will start to uh, take blood sample from patients and look whether they have uh, antibodies of different pathogens. And also, of course, it would need, in case of Toxoplasmos, you would not only need to know whether you have antibodies or not, you should be able to do a brain scan and look whether you have those cysts in your brain. And uh, if there is cysts in the brain, then you know that uh, that might be caused by those. Because in many cases, immune system is able to get rid of toxoplasmosis before it's able to enter inside the brain. And uh, of course, in that case, you, uh, it's false positive if you think that uh, schizophrenia is imposed in that patient by, by toxoplasmos. So maybe in the future they will classify schizophrenia based on the, uh, on the pathogen that causes it. Like in the case previous that syphilis was associated, on, but nowadays they don't uh, classify it as a schizophrenia, they just classify it as a uh, symptom caused by, by syphilis. Like uh, also if you get uh, Psychosis, because of encephalitis, it's not classified as schizophrenia, it's just classified as, as uh, psychosis caused by encephalitis. So I would have, I would have uh, another talk, but uh, it's too much for one, <laughs> one day. There is one, one question here from Sophia from the internet. And she's, she's, she said, thank you for the comprehensive summary. Uh, what do you think about individualistic approach for some depression is caused by modern lifestyles, other is their genetics? And maybe this question can be applied to other schizophrenia bipolar also. Yeah, I think that in future we will do ma much more individualistic treatment of all mental disorders because we need to know so much background information if we want to tailor effective treatments. So we need to know what kind of food person eats and then uh, make uh, recommendations how they should, should uh, change their diet and then we should ask about uh, childhood experience and whether they have effect on a on uh, that and uh, we should also ask about social life and things like that and and uh, it seems that it's uh, of course takes much more time than uh, nowadays you s nowadays if you go to meet psych psychiatrists they will speak with you 15 minutes and then they, they describe antidepressant but it's possible that in the future you, you need a couple of hours to uh, to learn to know that patient and then you make a individual tailored program how that uh, uh, this is could be correct. Yeah, very nice. So I have a question for you. Maybe it's, it will be your last question. Uh, now, you are talking now about individualized right, uh, uh, treatment for each person. But now, and you said many, in many cases here, you talk about how Brazilians are very bad on all those uh, uh, psychopathologists. So I would like you to know, I would like to know if you were, for instance, if you were, if you have the power, if you had, if you were the president, what would you change in Brazil for you to change all those high prevalence of psychopathological diseases here, disorders? Actually, it would be quite easy. Because it's known that inequality in the world uh, causes a lot of chronic stress and it's associated with many mental health problems. 
So they should increase tax rates for uh, rich people and uh, increase the uh, well-being of the poor people, and, uh, and that probably would be the most effective uh, way to influence on, on a mental health problem here. And uh, it, it would reduce crime rate and many other positive... That's actually what people do in, in Europe, and uh, that's why the prevalences are a little bit lower. Of course, it's not perfect, but, uh, uh, but I think that the, my, my opinion, uh, because today when I saw the city, it was quite obvious that one reason why you have so high prevalence of mental disorders is because there is so huge uh, inequalities in the wealth and there is a lot of poor people and uh, so it's known to cause uh, stress and, uh, and so I think that uh, also you could uh, change the architecture of the city so that there would be more green space that would be also effective but, but uh, I think that the strongest effect would be changed politics here. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Marcus. It was a pleasure to receive you here. It was really interesting talks, and I hope everybody enjoyed it, and we have it uh, uh, recorded on YouTube, so anytime you want to listen to that again, you just access the link. Thank you so much, and now we can finish our evolutionary psychology lectures. Thank you, man. <laughs>